not be afraid. And when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me, need of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, and war rise up against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of Lord, that I will seek after all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted high above my enemies. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of praise in his tabernacle. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O oh Lord, when I cry with my voice. also upon me and answer me. When you said seek my face my heart said unto me thy face Lord will I see. Do not Hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. For you, Lord, have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. O oh God, of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord, the Lord himself will take care of me. Teach me, O oh Lord, teach me thy way. And lead me in a smooth path because of my enemy. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me. And such and free out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed the report of the Lord. I would have lost heart had not I believed the report of the Lord. In the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord and he will strengthen your heart. Trust in the 
in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Trust in the Lord and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him. Do not fret because of who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wickedness, screams to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. He is ever merciful. And his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall fly. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. But the Lord will not leave him in his hand. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away and behold, he was no more. <clears throat> Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction, and then you say, return, O children of men, unto me. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and 
like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like sleep in the morning. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. But in the evening, it is cut down and it withers. For we have been consumed. And your wrath, we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sign. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only in labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off. And we fly away. Who knows the power of the Lord? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us, O oh Lord, teach us how to number our days. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. The scripture teaches that when a family member goes to be with the Lord, it's absent in the body, but present with the Lord. I would ask you to step out of your grief and step into your faith. Put your hands together and give Charlie Tucker a brand new place. Take it over to a place, to a place that's over over. I know there's some sickness in
Amen. To the family. Amen. We pray. Continue to pray that God comforts your heart. Let us pray. Oh, most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we come right now first and foremost to thank you and praise you for you being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We come right now on this day to celebrate, Lord. Celebrate this giant of a man, Lord. To celebrate, Lord, this man, Lord, who loved, Lord. This man, Lord, who provided, Lord. This man, Lord, who gave out of his sustenance, Lord. And we ask right now, Lord, that you touch his family, Lord. Touch those, Lord, who are connected to him, whether it's by blood or by love. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, for him coming by our way, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard, Lord, from him, from what we saw he do, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you touch, Lord, those, Lord, who come in, uh, come after him, Lord, his legacy, Lord. Um, we ask, Lord, that you touch, Lord. We know, Lord, that, Lord, he was tired, Lord. From the last time, Lord, he was at church, Lord, I saw him coming in, and Lord, he was he was struggling. But then, Lord, I remember, Lord, the uh, last time, the previous time that he had came, and he said, "I'm gonna sing in that choir. Uh, I'm gonna sing in that choir," is what he said. Uh, but we know, Lord, that um, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. So, Father. We thank you right now, Lord, that he's in his new body, Lord. I, I don't know um, what new body he's in, but I know this family. Uh, he ain't wearing glasses no more. I know this family. Uh, he ain't struggling no more. I know this family. He don't need help walking no more. I know this family. You don't have to feed him no more. You don't have to do any of that because right now, he's in the choir right now. Right now, he's singing his song right now. He's doing what he wants to do in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we magnify you, Lord, as tears stream. We ask right now, Lord, that you give the family what they need, Lord, as tears stream. We ask right now that you flood their minds with the memories of good as tears stream. We ask right now, Lord, that you give them day by day, moment by moment, week by week, month by month, and year by year what they need to carry on. Your word tells us in John 14 that you will send a comforter. Lord, send that helper, Lord, to anyone that's struggling right now. Send that helper, Lord, to anyone that's struggling and who will be struggling in the midnight hour. We thank you, we praise you, and we magnify you for this giant of a man. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our scripture lesson will come from Old Testament will come from a very familiar text. I always say, if you have spent any time in the church at all, sleeping or otherwise, you would have been unheard. <laughs> Heard the scripture, amen? Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Again, that's Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Starting at verse 1. And it reads, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace 
and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to take and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Our second scripture lesson comes from the New Testament. John chapter 14. Starting at verse 1. And it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. The word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. One thing you should know is that Charlie Chuck planned his own funeral. Uh, from yesterday to today, we've been in preparation and meetings and called meetings and come to the house and we sat and we listened and he planned his own. One thing he said was that he wanted to be joyful. And I know that God is so good by allowing this icon to come our way. Say all that because we are blessed uh, to have a selection uh, that came from Bishop, uh, Brother Bishop, and now from the time of Crawford, and she coming our own way. God bless you.
Something about when you put your hands in the hands of an unchanging hand. Dad picked out the musicians too, so just so y'all, y'all are aware of what's going on in this house this morning. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. At this time, uh, we're going to have remarks that's going to come um, in this order. Uh, we're going to have Robert Sonny Welch come, after which uh, Larry Sykes will come. And then we will have the Juice family, all of the Juice family will come uh, up and the representative will speak uh, for us. So, so in that one. church, our pastor always said, when the spirit is high, let the church say amen. 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 That was beautiful. I really enjoyed it. God bless you. I would just like to say that I deem it an honor, having been asked to say a few words of expressions on behalf of my cousin, first cousin, first of all, first cousin, but... He was one of the cousins of me. He was like a brother. Charlie Chuck and I go back, all the way back to our early years, even before our teen years, even back, back when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten. And he and I grew closer and closer as the years came on. I was uh, in the middle, well, my mother and my her sister married my dad and his brother. So it was two, two brothers married, two sisters in that. And with my uh, dad's brother, George Welch, and my aunt, Ethel May Welch, they had boys, boys, boys. I'll put it that way. And with my mother and my dad, Khalid Welch, got married, they started having children. My mother had two girls first. Then she had me. I was in the in the book. Then she had two more girls. So that meant that me being the only boy of Cleve and Gert Welch, I was cl drawn close to my first cousin, my close boys, Uncle George and and Uncle May's boys. So we drew close, and we all lived right th right together on side of one street, and then the other right together. So we grew up as Brothers. So I just felt like uh, Chuck was my brother instead of my cousin. So that's the way we always uh, stayed together. Even when he left Talladega, Alabama, and ventured out to Detroit, and then from there on, uh, we still could, uh, were close, but we kind of drew apart for a certain time because he was gone and I was still down in Alabama. But I say all that to say this, that Chuck and I would be closer, especially during the last, I would say, 20, 25, 30 years, especially after we, the Welch family, had started having family reunions. And when we all came together, as first it started off every year, but then later on we changed every two years. And just to just a note, to let you know that next year we will be celebrating the Welch family reunion our 50th anniversary, wow. 50th anniversary wow. next year. So we all stay close. We all stay close together as well. So I just want to, I know that I only have a few minutes that I want to stay here too long, but uh, I was always taught to say what you have to say. Get up, speak up, shut up, sit down and shut up. <laughs> so that's what I plan on doing. I just want to draw your attention. On yesterday, uh, we had our I guess you call it viewing at the, uh, the other church. And the majority of Chuck's uh, work-related uh, buddies and 
uh, Brazen says they all pretty much had what they had to say yesterday in reference to his uh, businesses, in reference to his uh, work-related uh, efforts and all of that. And one thing that I just want to take time out now to just to concentrate on is the uh, earliest, his, his earliest occupation. And that earliest occupation, as it was stated in yesterday's uh, bulletin, was as a uh, golf cat. He's, he, this was one of his first occupations as a golf cat. And I was right there with them as a golf cat also. So we grew up, the Welch boys grew up going to the golf course, the local golf course, the cat. That's how we all earned our spending money, our little chunk, chunk change, as some people would say. That's how we all kept a few pennies in our pocket. So uh, I just like, just like for you to concentrate on two words, uh, clubhouse, <laughs> clubhouse. We never called the local golf course the country club, the golf course. We always said the clubhouse. That's what our mom, moms and our, our sisters and all of our relatives knew around town. They, where, where's Sonny? He's at the, at the clubhouse. Where's Chuck? Where's Chuck? He's at the clubhouse. We all were always at the clubhouse. That's how we learned to play golf. So I just want to call your attention to about the sixth page of your program. You'll see a picture of Charlie Chuck here. And he always wanted me to make sure that I mentioned a few things that happened during our journey from, during our journey from uh, home to the clubhouse. Okay, and we had about a four or five mile walk from our home to the, to the clubhouse. And during that uh, walk, we always had to uh, go uh, uh, near or uh, around a certain uh, uh, parcel of land that uh, this person owned. This was like a couple of acres. Sometimes you could go all the way around the road to the clubhouse, or we could take the shortcut across this land that this person owned. And quite often, Chuck and I would go across this land to take the shortcut. And one, one day, uh, the person that owned this land caught us traveling uh, across this open land. There was a lot of trees and bushes and things of that nature, and a lot of trees and spruce trees and evergreen trees, and we were back in those days we called Christmas trees. And okay, so during the uh, December uh, cold months when there wasn't too much going on at the clubhouse, we were trying to figure out how we could get our uh, chump change, our pocket money, our chump change. So Chuck, Chuck came up, we were going across this land at this one particular time, and Chuck came across the idea. He said, okay, son, I think what we're going to do. You see that, that beautiful tree over there? We're going to cut that tree down, and we're going to take it around to the, to the front door of this person that owns this land, and give it, sell it to him for his Christmas tree. <laughs> this is the person that owned the land. <laughs> so if that was his idea, so we did that. We cut this tree down one time, we all went, and then, then he cut the tree down, and we went around to the front of the house, rung the doorbell, and the man came to the to the door, and we wanted to say, you have your Christmas tree, so isn't it pretty, isn't it it's nice? The man said, yeah, that's a nice Christmas tree. So he reached in his pocket and pulled out two, two one dollar bills and gave it to him. And we sold him his own property, his Christmas tree. <laughs> And Chuck tells that story all the time. And one other one I will follow up that one up with uh, one, one of these one other time we were going to the clubhouse and doing our shortcut, the man also had apple trees on his leg. And so we were on our way to the golf course to the clubhouse and we thought we would just stop and pick a couple pretty apples and start eating them. This time the man caught us. Uh -oh. He caught us. And we were eating out with juicy apples and everything. He said, why are y'all still in my apple? All of a sudden, Chuck got these apples. He said, so I, tears started coming up. We're sorry, sir, we're hungry. <laughs> so, so he, he had tears coming down and, and, and I was, I didn't say it, I was afraid the man was gonna lock us up. So the man said, okay, okay, okay. Next time, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear no story, no excuse. You can go this time, but I don't want to catch him still at my apples anymore. So we went on about our business. I just wanted to make those two comments uh, on behalf of Charlie Chuck. So that's where he was and how he has always been 
had an entrepreneurial spirit. He was always thinking about how he could make his next dime, the next dollar. So that's the first kind of person he was. And I just want to leave you with a one word of scripture found in Revelation 21st chapter. And it's the fourth verse, and it uh, says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I would just like to leave that scripture and these words to the family. Charlie Chuck left us all an amazing legacy. So let's not grieve. Let us uh, continue on from here, realizing, recognizing the fact that Charlie Chuck was an amazing person. He left us an amazing legacy to Bernard, my cousin. I just want to let you know, and the family, the Welch family, just always remember his legacy. If there is no need for us to cry or be uh, weary and well going. Let us remember that. He left us an amazing le legacy to follow him. God bless you. Thank you. We're going to have a very decisive run at this time. While he's coming, we definitely want to recognize the pastors and the ministers that are here uh, with us today. God bless you all.
Katrina stopped by and said, Mr. Sykes, you know my father wants you to speak at his funeral. I told her to tell your father to keep on living because I don't feel like talking to you both now. February, I was notified that Rosalind wanted, excuse me, in February, I was notified that Rosalind Welch wanted to speak to me. And could I put a please put a call into her? I said, sure. And put a call into her and told, I put a call into her. She told me that her father had been asking about me and wanted to speak with me. She told me the best time to call him was between 6 and 7.30 p.m. The next day, I followed up with a call to Mr. Welch. We talked and we laughed about the good times. He said, Larry, do you remember me coming to your office and you taking me up to the eighth floor to the president's office and telling him he needed to finance my station? I said, I did. Because it had been so long, I forgot. In fact, I think I had hair in I said, I forgot. He said, yeah, the president's name was Don Kincaid. I said, wow, I guess you're right. And we both laughed. Last time I called Mr. Welch, he was taking communi communion. And we didn't speak long. Rosalind took the phone and said that he can't talk right now. I told her that I was being released early and not to tell your father, let's surprise him. He said, great, my dad said he wasn't going anywhere. Until you come home. Ladies and gentlemen, I was serving a four month sentence but was released, serving, released after 90 days. I came home March 25th and had the privilege, and, the privilege and pleasure of sitting down and spending quality time with Mr. Welch. And for that I felt that I was blessed. I would say to him, Chuck, there's grape juice, cherry juice, orange juice, apple juice, prune juice, but the best juice is the Welsh juice. <laughs> to the family, those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day, unseen, unheard, but always near, still loved, still missed, and still highly respected. The ones we love and do lives on through their deeds, through their knowledge they leave behind, and what and when we speak and think of them. But we have to continue to live our lives so that we can keep them alive. Count your blessings so that you may bless others. Family, God has a purpose for your pain, a reason for your struggle, and a reward for your faithfulness. So don't give up. Continue to be faithful and grateful. Family, only your pillow knows the number of tears you cry. Only God knows the pain and sorrow you harbor inside. But I submit to you that if you put your faith in the man that walked the water, Put your faith in the man that parted the sea. He will do for you what he did for me. God bless this family for sharing their father to this community. God bless this family for their loss. And let us keep this family in our prayers. Thank you. So, Larry, I was actually there serving communion. And I must tell you the joy that was on his face when he got your call. So we thank you uh, for doing that and being a part of your family as well. So our, our boss lady, Deborah Hogan, uh, if you would stand and all of those who come on up, Juice family, past and present, our radio personalities and staff, uh, if you are here today, if 
you will call my good son. All sad, the living child, as the present. see what he has done for us. So Charlie Chuck was a visionary and an icon and we are so blessed to be part of this vision that has shaped the essence of this community. You know, he gave me and everyone alongside me today, so many of others, a shot, a chance. And he provided a, a unique opportunity that opened the doors for so many. And we are truly grateful. He encouraged, he encouraged us to use the radio platform to our advantage, but also to the greater good. And that includes the community and to be a personality radio. See, we're not jocks. We are radio personalities. So personality, that's right. Personality radio at its finest. And because he was such a wonderful mentor and father figure, he supported our dreams and our endeavors outside of the station walls. And because of that, so many of us have gone on to do so many amazing things in the community and across, across the country. He accepted us with open arms and our families and even our children. Our children are also pooter wooters too. <laughs> which, is, which is partially why most of us are still at the station today. You know, the professional life lessons he taught us along the way have shaped us as individuals. We love him and we will miss him dearly. And we are truly grateful to be part of his vision, his legacy, to give a voice to the voiceless and part of the community. And, and to the Welch family, we thank you for embracing us and our families with, with open arms, sharing your father with us, sharing your grandfather with us, granddad, and we are here for you, and we, we love you. Thank you. So Mr. Welch taught us how to, to walk into uh, to the building, because um, he taught us that we had to, to walk in and make sure we was watching our back before we actually went into the building uh, and locked the door behind us. <laughs> and at first I didn't get it. Um, but he was always a father figure. And one of the things that he was doing was safeguarding us, but also safeguarding the station because someone could come behind you, hijack the station, and use the radio to do evil. But we thank God for a man who has done good across the radio. At this time, we're gonna have Deborah Rivers come for the reading of the obituary. I think this note is for me. It says you have two minutes, please. <laughs> I was also asked to read some of the acknowledgments to the family of W. Charles Welch. We, the pastor, ministers, officers, and members of the St. Paul Amy Zion Church would like to express to you and your family our deepest sympathy in the loss of your dearly departed father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, uncle, cousin, and friend, W. Charles Welch. Whereas in love and infinite wisdom, 
God has freed W. Charles Welch from the labor and travail of this life and called him to rest to a place of comfort and joy, which God has prepared for each of his children. In this time of sorrow, we encourage you with the words written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight, but we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The time of groaning and travail for W. Charles Welch is now over. His earthly house has been vacated and now W. Charles Welch has moved to a house not made with hands. To God be the glory. Done by the order of the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church on this fourth day of May in the year of our Lord, 2024, Reverend Darren Overton, Pastor. To the Hogan family, on behalf of the Spencer family, I'm not sure what this is. There were so many, uh, so many expressions of sympathy. We will just read who they are from, from Silent Rock Church. Dr. Willie C. Howard Garrett, senior pastor. From Beta Phi Sigma chapter of Toledo, brother Dr. Willie C. Howard Garrett. St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. James H. Willis, senior. Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. Willie L. Perryman, Jr., Senior Pastor. From the Trustee Board, the Lay Council of the St. Paul Andy Zion Church. From the Gabriel family, Teresa M. M. Gabriel and family. From the Toledo ICUA, Internominal Church Association of Toledo, from the state of Ohio, ICUA. We also have a resolution from the Lucas County Recording Office, Michael D. Ashford, Lucas County Recorder. I'm sure the family is going to acknowledge all of these at a later date. It was stated earlier that Mr. Welch planned his own funeral. It was less than two weeks ago, I was at a service and Deborah came to me as I was leaving. She said, Dad wants you to read this obituary at his funeral. And I said, I said, Deborah. She said, no, he wants you to do that. I said, I will do whatever Mr. Welch wants me to do. So it is an honor for me to be here on this morning to uh, be in this service and want the family to know how much we love you and how we are praying for you. So here is the obituary, pre-written by W. Charles Welch. I didn't want this to be the typical funeral that we have been going to. So I borrowed this idea from my cousin, Beverly Welch, back in 2021. I will thank her when I see her up there. So here we go. I was the fifth son born on November 8, 1938 in Talladega, Alabama, between George and Elkhome Welch. 
Out of nine of us boys, I was the middle one, four older and four younger. Let me name my other siblings, starting with the oldest, Dan Edward, George Calvin, James Harvey, Jimmy Earl. My poor mother was having children so fast, she named one James and the next one Jimmy. <laughs> Number five son, she named Willie Charles. Now you know what that W stands for. I had Willie changed legally to just W. Charles. Number six was Benny Leon, Richard Dale, Milton Lamar, and baby brother Carter Wayne. <coughs> Wayne is the last living out of nine boys. We have two sisters, Janice Denise and Talladega, by my mother, and Rose and Hell in Detroit by my father after they split up. There was no work in Talladega, and mother didn't want to leave her mother, my grandmother, in Talladega. There was nothing to do in Talladega for adults but work in the fields and make moonshine and go to church. Me and my brothers and male cousins worked at the golf course as caddies. All of the Welsh men and boys could play a good game of golf and earn enough money to buy snacks and pay 15 cents to get into the movies. When not playing with the boys, you would find me working in my granddaddy's papa store, Welch's Grocery, which was next door to our house. We were very poor people living in Talladega. There were times I would see our mother go to the banks of the railroad track where, where wild onions would grow, bringing the wild onions back to the house and cook them for supper, along with whatever she could gather up to go along with the stove top cornbread. Other times, we would wake up at eight o'clock on Sunday for grits, eggs, bacon and ham, fried chicken, etc. That was breakfast and brunch. Come home in the evening for supper with hot rolls, potatoes, greens, and other food from our garden. There were all of us boys on mama's side and most of the girls on Aunt Gert's side. I forgot to tell you, we were double cousins. Two brothers, George and Cleve, married two sisters, Ella May and Gertrude Carter. This part is submitted by the family. At the age of 12, he moved to Detroit, Michigan to be with his father. He joined Greater St. Peter A.B. Zion Church where his dad attended. His dad spoke with him, to him about the Chester family, a nice family at the church he should connect with. He then met Marjorie Chester at choir rehearsal. They became sweethearts at the age of 13 and 14. When Marjorie turned 16, they were pre-engaged. <laughs> Charles joined the United States Army at age 17, serving his country in Germany. Charles and Mar Marjorie married and went on to have four children, Rosalind, Katrina, Deborah, and Charles Bernard, along with Chuck's youngest daughter, Trina. Mr. Welch, has a long list of jobs and businesses, including jobs as a golf caddy in Alabama, worker at Dodge, Maine, selling Kirby vacuums, teaching driver's education, car salesman at Grogan Town, WKLR, the Ohio Library Commission, Barn and Cable in Detroit, Fox 36, KCOH in Houston, Texas, WBOI in Toledo, main pianist at nightclubs in Detroit, owning the Pantheon Theater, Pantheon Records, a church's chicken franchise, and part owner of a nightclub in Detroit called the Cherry Garden and a recording artist. Mr. Welch started his career in radio in the 1960s, working for free at WJLB. He was encouraged by Jeff WJLB's infamous DJ Kern, Master Blaster Bell, 
that their sister station in Toledo was hiring. He got the job at Toledo Radio, working at WKLR in 1969. His radio name is Charlie Chalk. In 1997, Mr. Welch started the Juice FM 107.3 WJCU and entered the history books by becoming the first African American in Ohio to start a radio station from the ground up. Mr. Welch received numerous awards and accolades throughout his 56 years in Toledo. Thank you. Charles was predeceased in his, in his death by Queen Marjorie Chester Welch, parents Ethel May and George Welch, senior, granddaughter Cindy Lynn, and seven brothers. He is survived by his daughter, Rosalind Welch, Katrina Welch Andre, Deborah Lynn Hogan Richard, Trina Lyons Bishop Arthur, and son Charles B. Sisters Janice Brasher, Rose Nell Luke, baby brother Carter Wayne Welch, and four sisters in law. He also leaves behind 18 grandchildren, seven great grandchildren, and two more on the way and so many others that he looked upon as his children and family. To God be the glory. Just in case you didn't hear, he was the first African American in Ohio to start a radio station from the ground up. So for so long, it was it was hard to get in the family. I won't talk about it, but um, it was hard. It was hard to get in the family, though. Um, yeah, it was hard. I mean, uh, Rosalind brought me around and, and the stairs. Um, and Katrina, and, uh, she was a retired officer who looked up my background and got my police report. <laughs> It was hard, y'all. Uh, Deborah was just like looking like, I don't know who he is, but he is who he is. And Bernard was gone, so when he came back, he didn't realize he had, had another son. <laughs> and, and so for a long time, y'all, now he told his W. I was trying to figure out what W meant, um, and I thought I would be smart and wait till he signed that check. <laughs> And I thought he was going to officially sign the check, but when I got the check, it said W. Charles. <laughs> but when I found out it was Willie, I, I was wondering, should I change? I'm Willie Charles too, since y'all don't know that much. So I thought I should change my name to W. In fact, it sounds pretty good. What's your name, W? <laughs> We're going to hear a selection from Mr. Crawford.
Amen. Well, thank everybody for coming today. Um, and I want to I want to tell my brother-in-law Arthur that your father-in-law would be so happy for how you performed on that saxophone today. You put your foot in, and your father-in-law would be so happy on how you performed. I guess that's why he had picture. Not for my sister, but you know, to perform. Um, it's beautiful to see all these familiar faces, all these loving faces, all these kind faces. It is um my people talk about my father being a caddy. Let me tell you how much of a hustler he was. My father would tell me stories that when he was caddy as a kid, he would uh he would be a caddy for the white folks and he would find their balls that they would get off in the rough or whatever, he'd put it in his pocket. And then after 18, he would sell them back their balls that they lost. <laughs> because <laughs> he was hustling. <laughs> he was hustling. He was hustling. Um, my birthday is coming up in a couple weeks. And uh, this year will be different because every year on my birthday, uh, my phone rings, usually around the time I was born, around three in the afternoon, I believe, or something like that. And it would be my father. And he would call me on that birthday, on that time, and not to say something like, you know, I love you. It wasn't, no, he didn't say I love you or anything like that. It wasn't what he was calling for. He was calling to tell me, he would, the conversation would go something like, you know, such and such years ago at this time, I was threatening that doctor I was going to kill him. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, dad, I know. No, for real, because he was late showing up, because he was on the golf course or something like that. He was on the golf course or something. I know that's where he was. And the doctor told my father that he had a choice, that he could save me or he could save my mother. And my father went and got his pistol. He said, you're going to save both of them. <laughs> and he saved both of us. That was my father taking care of the ones he loved at all costs, no matter what. And um, it's hard because they said my father's been playing this, this funeral for years. And uh, he asked me to do his eulogy years ago. And I wrote it last night, well, this morning. So that goes to show you. But when he tells you to do something, uh, you can't begin to understand the weight that it puts on you. And you don't think it's ever going to come. But one day it does come. And you have to put into words what this man who has been your hero, literally your hero, means to you. And everyone is aware of all the things that Charlie Chuck has done, the parties, the concerts, uh, the radio events. But do you really know W. Charles Walsh? Or what the W stands for. Some of y'all just found that out today. How do you speak about a boy who came from rural Talladega, Alabama in the 1930s? Alabama in the 1930s and what he was brought into. How do you talk about a man who's last, who lost his parents, his siblings, his grandchild, his dear friends, and the love of his life? but he kept on believing and kept on living. I can't. How am I supposed to tell you about a man that joined the military, went all the way to Germany and fought for a country that didn't love him when he got back? How am I supposed to convey all of you to fight the fight and determination that that man had who got knocked down, beat up, boxed out, denied, and still fought his way to do some incredible things. I can't. There are no words to convey such sentiment and emotion. But what I can do is I can tell you about my God. I can tell you about our God. I can tell you about the best dressed, loudest talking, funny acting, no nonsense, would kill for his family, man, that is W. Charles Welch. That man born in the 30s Alabama 
served this country overseas and started multiple businesses, helped those in the community that needed it, started a radio station that changed the direction of an entire community. That radio station changed the direction of an entire community. A community that he was not even born into, but he adopted as his own. And how can I also tell you about a man that took care of his family and most of all loved God? I remember I got a boil on my face, on my nose, on my cheek or something, and my face was swollen. It got swollen really quick. And I came home and my three sisters were home and um, they said, what happened to you? And I jokingly said I got beat up by the police. It was a joke. I went upstairs, went by my business, went outside, played with my friends. My father came home and called me home. He said, come here. I walked in the house, I thought I was gonna get a whooping for something because he whooped me. And he pulled me outside. He said, what happened to you? I said, what? He said, what happened to your face? I said, I got a boil. They told me the police beat you up. So they had called him at work and told him Bernard got beat up by the police. He came home and he was ready. I said, no, no, I got a boil on my face. He said, oh, dang it. Let me call my brothers from Detroit and tell them don't come down here. I got to come. He was a rider. He was a rider. There was a time where there was this big dude who, was, who had a problem mentally and with me. And he came to a radio station. He was threatening me. He was threatening my family. He was about to whoop us. He was going to whoop us. He was threatening to kill us. And I was like, Dad, I can talk to this dude. I can talk to him. So I went outside the radio station. I tried to talk to this big, massive dude who was off his meds and was crazy and wanted to kill me and my family. And I'm talking to him and I couldn't get, really get away from him and get away from him and he was, he was nodding back and forth. And I happened to look over his shoulder and I looked and one of the doors in the corner of the radio station was propped open. And I saw my daddy's face and the barrel of his gun. And I was like, I hope he a good shot. Cause we stand real close to each other and I don't want him to I don't want him to pick me off, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, that same father who was allowed me, he would hold his hand up like this and I would hang on his bicep. I would swing on his bicep. That's how strong he was or how little I was, I don't know. And the same man who whooped me in a circle, I hold my left hand up and whooped me with his right. My sons, playing golf with them as kids. And they, my one son hit a ball and it hit his new car. And my father said, that's okay. Who are you? Who, who was that man who said that's okay that you can hit his car with a golf ball? So I just want to point out again that the man I grew up with is not the, my kids, and that's not the same granddaddy as y'all. That's not the same one. But, He's also the same man who wouldn't let his family travel on the same plane because he didn't want us all to get wiped out if something happened. He wanted the legacy to live on no matter what. And he believed in that legacy. And he left his impact on the world. He came in and he did what he did. And he left the world a better place. And when it started making me think, this is what I came up with this morning, he was, you couldn't put him in a box. You couldn't put him in a mold. He would adapt to whatever situation it called for. He was, a, he was singing the church choir. He would, he would be charitable to you. And if he had to, he would cuss you out and threaten you <laughs> for messing with his family. And when I say family, I don't mean just blood. All those people who are standing up there for that radio station, they're all his children. And it, he reminded me that he was kind of like water. And I wrote some things down. It's like when a wave is in the ocean, it's clear what it is. You can see the height. You can see the, the light reflect off of it. You can see its speed. You, you may be able to predict where the wave is going to hit the shore. But what you can't predict is the mark that it will leave 
once it arose. The wave might carry life with it. It may leave it on the shore. It might use itself to, to water and nurture the life that's already a part of the landscape. A large wave could even crash against the sand, and as it returns back to the sea, it can pull away all the trash and debris and even the things that seem important and permanent and leave behind a clean landscape without some of the obstacles that would have normally been in the way. It leaves behind a shore that is perfectly pristine. But it's also a shore that is waiting for you to put your footprints in it. Make your own mark. The wave has moved things out of your way now that it is, now it's your turn to walk your path across the beach. But the wave, well, the wave must return back to the ocean because at its very core, it is just water. For a moment in time, it pushed by the very place where it was originated and was used to make a change in the land, but it's only temporary. Whether subtle or impactful, the way it did its job, just like my father. My father was just like that way. He came crashing upon the shoreline of life and made a difference. He brought life. He cleaned up the landscape. And he left things better than they were when he got here. But he was also like water in its other forms. Like the glaciers in the Arctic. He was steadfast in his journey, moving slow, moving steady, with great power and force. Like those huge chunks of ice, what you see is only a small part of who he was. Because the greatest part of that man, my father, lied beneath the surface, providing strength and stability for us all. And now he's like that steam. After doing all the things and all the forms, making all the changes to everything and everyone around. He's now like that steam rising to the heavens and leaving behind a beautiful rainbow as a reminder that he was here. I saw him shed a tear twice my entire life. When my mother passed and when he held his great granddaughter. As we place him in his final resting place, with all of his, with his granddaughter near his feet and his beloved wife Marjorie at his side, we should all be reminded that our story isn't over until it's over. Our story is ever changing, ever growing, ever evolving, and most of all, it is a story that is written by our Creator and no man can put his pen to those papers. No man can change a thing. No man can put his spin on it. God wrote this man's story. God put his mighty pen in action and watched it play out. Magnificently it played out. God wrote this glorious story of trials, this glorious story of tests, this glorious story of triumphs, this glorious story of missteps and of great strides. This God wrote my father's glorious story of change, the glorious story of growth, the story of determination in the face of denial, this glorious story of pride and joy. God wrote this glorious story of fight and strength and the story of love. So with that we say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, W. Charles Welch. Well done, Charlie Chuck. And since this is your story, it is only right that we close this chapter in your words. The first is to love one another, pray for peace, and fight like hell for happiness. And the second is to my family. Our father, our grandfather, our father-in-law, our uncle, our cousin.
cousin, our great grandfather, he left us with the perfect example of how to live. He left us with the perfect example of how to behave. Our God left us with every single thing we need to survive in life. It's already in us. We got it from him and it's in us. It's just up to us to carry on. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all for coming. But most importantly, thank God for my father, W. Charles Walsh. Amen.